Hello and welcome to D&D with High School Students, Season 3. I am with Beecher, and today we are going to put the finishing touches on Beecher's character prior to his prelude adventure. Beecher, you have made Olin the, yes. the warlock of some mysterious background. Yeah. You have chosen to be a fallen Acemar. And um, just so you people know, we read the comments, and many of you... We're like, Beecher, make a Hexblade! Like, there were some comments that yeah. were in all caps. They're like, Hexblade rules! So, what did we do? We looked at Xanathar's guide. Yep, looked at them all. Uh, had a tough time picking it out and sure. kind of choosing which one I wanted. Yeah, but uh, there were some really cool... But... I decided to go with Hexblade. Yes. Yes. So, uh, appealing which, to the masses. Right, and it, it works out... You know, not just for combat and strategy and stuff, but it works yeah. out from a role-playing perspective because in Beecher's Prelude, we're going to talk about how his choices create his character, and then together we're going to kind of determine his Prelude and his character's motivation. So yeah. let's talk. If you look at the features that you're provided with with Hexblade, what, um, and, and you consider also that you are a fallen ASMR warlock, Let's yes. talk about the, the, the pact, the patron, the whole thing. Yeah, so um, in terms of pact, I wanted to go with pact of the chain. Kind of the main reason I wanted to go with warlock was pact of the chain because um, I wanted that familiar really badly. Mm -hmm. And I'm deciding I want to go with the pseudo dragon just because I think it's the coolest looking. Um, uh, and... That kind of leads into my invocations. Um, first, I picked Agonizing Blast because you're a goof if you don't pick that and you're a warlock. Um, mm -hmm. And then I did Voice of the Chain Master, which allows me to communicate telepathically with my familiar. And I can, like, talk through him and use all his senses. Which is um, pretty awesome. Oh, yeah, definitely. So... Um Let's talk your fallen ASMR background, as well as your patron. Yeah. So, um, Xanathar's Guide provides ideas about um, the patron when it comes to, to Hexblade. In my original world, there are five de deities. Not, sorry, not the original world. For Nuwaf Oatmai, the continent that you guys are on, there are five deities, right? And they, right. they represent the elemental forces, typically. So... You have earth, wind, fire, water, and then the void. Now, I think before even telling you my thoughts, if you looked at those five options and you thought about being a fallen ASMR and a hex blade, <laughs> you, you could pretty much yeah. guess which one I'm going for. Yeah. The void? The void, yeah. Okay. Now, the <laughs> thing about the void is, is that it's of, of those five, it's the most mysterious. Some cultures, some people associate the void with death. Others associate it just with uh, chaos or entropy. Yeah. Some associate it with like nothingness, like pure neutrality. So there are a lot of different interpretations culturally around the continent and even uh, religiously, philosophically, about the meaning of the void. In your character's case, you're going to have a very personal and individual agreement that goes beyond most people because... You're a warlock. Yeah. You've made a pact, okay? Yeah. What pact? In your experience with the Void, um, you, you had direct contact with an entity of the Void. Okay. You don't know its specific name, um, but you were told in this dreamlike vision experience that you had when you initially made the pact that it would be revealed once you had demonstrated that you would keep your side of the bargain. Yeah, and that certain things would be revealed to you and you would know when you had to do those things. Now, since the initial pact and that initial vision dream that you had, you have received little hints every once in a while. And oftentimes, it's through your familiar. Like, okay. when your familiar normally communicates with you there's there's like a knowing that it's your familiar but every yeah. once in a while you'll get like a weird voice not necessarily spoken but like telepathically 
where you know that it's not your familiar, it's actually your your patron yeah. communicating to you through your familiar. Okay. Um, one of the things that you've been drawn to do is um, sometimes just adventuring for the purpose of investigating or researching things. And oftentimes your patron doesn't really explain why it needs okay. you to do these things. But you've also been kind of taken care of along the way. Like there have been times where you're kind of destitute and you just feel a force pulling you in like some weird random direction and you stumble across like an old burned down farmhouse and underneath the floorboards is a chest of gold, right? Like just yeah. random little things along the way that have where you get a sense of something and you're guided to it and then your means are taken care of. Okay. So most recently... You've been exploring, you keep getting drawn out to the wilds, outside of civilization. And you'll be just traveling on the roads, and you'll, you'll come across an area that seems very rural, very remote, and you'll feel a pull. And um, this began about a year ago. And the first time it happened, you were pulled to just this spot of ground. So you went back to a small village, you bought a shovel, you came back, and you just started digging. And you found a skull, a very odd skull. This would be the part where you'd want to have a pencil, just for taking notes somewhere. Yeah. You found a very odd skull. The shape of the skull is what threw you, because it was much larger than any humanoid skull you've ever seen. Humanoid, like a human skull, but really big that was the first thing that kind of threw you no no explanation no feedback from your patron okay and this continued you know you'd be traveling around and like you just feel this weird pull and again similar situation you're in a a, a grove of like bamboo for far as the eyes can see right it's like kind of a hot summer rain season bamboo forest you're digging through and you're, okay. you're digging up the muck. And again, you pull out a very strange thing. You pull out this, this wooden box that's nearly rotted out from moisture. Mm -hmm. But you, you open it up and there's a candle. And the, the candle is, looks very, very, very old. But it appears to be wax. And inside the candle wax, you... you see things in there like little orbs and as you examine it closer you realize that they are eyeballs this big fat candle do you have arcana has a proficiency uh yes i do okay i'm not gonna have you make a roll but it seems like this would be somehow used in a ritual what ritual you're not sure but you find this big fat candle okay. and it, it is encased in the wax are literally eyeballs um and again, you're like, you know, you, you, you question, yeah. you reach out to your patron, but there's no, no feedback. You just, you know, keep it. And um, after a few more months of this, you've just assembled like this hodgepodge of random, seemingly random objects. Um, another thing that you find is the skeleton of five snakes. Skeletons of five snakes that the tails are coiled together, somehow like grafted. Like, there's actually bone that grafts the five skeletons together. And there's, like, a, a metal wire con keeping the spinal column of each snake together, you know, so it doesn't just fall apart. Yeah. So it's almost like a, a five little skeleton, snake skeleton things with the heads and fangs intact, and they're, they're like, the bone grafts them together at the tail. So after a while, you, you, you really can't carry all this crap. Like, you've got a backpack full of this yeah, weird stuff. So yeah. you actually go to the capital. You're drawn to the capital city of Poitak Shahar. And you find a bank um, where you are able to deposit these things into a chest where they can be kept safely. Um, you travel more, and throughout the hot, humid you know, summer season, remember this is kind of a Mediterranean locale, uh, you're out in the wilds, 
you're drawn to this very rural area. But at the same time, you know just through your travels that it's kind of dangerous at this season because yeah. there are roaming nomadic hordes of barbarians, specifically the Quoshin, which are dwarven barbarians. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of dangerous. So you're very kind of low-key, very careful. And at a certain point, you see this group traveling down the road. And there's like two wagons. And it's, it's a mix of some races, but you see a whole bunch of like warrior priestesses around one of the wagons. And the, the group travels along, and you see them kind of stop, and some of them veer off, and you see them exploring this, this little dip between some hills, this kind of wetland area. And you just kind of watch for a while. You see them exploring for maybe what's like a half hour, 45 minutes. And then they, they come back out and, and um, they leave. And at that point, you hear this urging from your patron. Again, communicating telepathically through your familiar to follow them. That they have something that you need. And that is where we will stop Beecher's prelude as he begins to follow a group of travelers a very familiar group of travelers, to the capital city of Poitax Shahar. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. And we will see you next time, next time. on D&D with High School Students, Season 3. Peace. Alright, thanks for watching that video. Make sure that you like and subscribe and don't forget to check out a lot of the other great content that I have on the channel. It's really awesome. You should check it out. I know what I'm talking about.